Peace be with you. Friends, we come to the fourth Sunday of Advent, and the church gives us this marvelous story of the visitation, Mary's visit to her cousin Elizabeth. And I'll tell you the word I've always loved in this story. It's the word haste. And let me just read to you the beginning of this, uh, this famous account. In those days, Mary set out with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. So we're right after the Annunciation. Mary has discovered her mission, and she goes quickly. She goes in haste. The reason she moves fast is she knows who she is, and she knows what she's about because she's found her role in the theodrama. I know I've used that word with you many times before. See, most of us are stuck in the boring and narrow confines of the ego drama. That's our little drama. I'm producing it. I'm directing it. I'm, above all, starring in it. It's this story that I'm making up on my own terms for my own purposes. Bore me to death with the ego drama. When you're caught in the ego drama, you don't really know who you are. You don't know where you're going because you've not been galvanized by some value, some good outside yourself that's calling you beyond the narrow confines of your little ego. Nothing's drawing you. Nothing's exciting you. The result of that is what I've called before the eh, culture. It's a lot of our culture. Eh. You know, I'm doing what, what I want to do and you're doing what you want to do, and, you know, above all, we better tolerate each other because I can't be imposing my view on you. There's nothing objectively true and good. That's just a power play. All we've got are these little egos generating their own little dramas and kind of tolerating everybody else. Nobody moves in haste in that environment. That's the, huh, who cares, bored culture. The classical spiritual writers, by the way, refer to that as sloth. It's one of the deadly sins. That means it's a lack of energy and purpose in regard to spiritual things. Mary is not playing an ego-dramatic game. She's playing a theodramatic game. God has revealed to her her mission, her purpose, and so she moves. As the sign of the saints, and even the contemplative saints, there's always something that's energetic about them. They know where they are and what they're going, where they're going. You know, I, I think here of Newman's famous image of the river. And he says, you know, what gives the river verve and energy and, and purpose and directionality are the firmness of its banks. If the banks are firm and the water's going to move with purpose through them. But knock down the banks, Newman says, and that river that's full of energy now just widens out into a big, lazy lake that's not really going anywhere. It's just kind of sitting there. That's a lot of our culture, everybody. That's a lot of our culture today is a lot of people lying on their individual air mattresses on this big, lazy lake without objective value, without a sense of purpose and verve and energy. That's why people aren't going in haste in the spiritual sense. They might be running around. <laughs> it's a lot of running around in our culture. But people aren't moving with that energy that comes from high spiritual purpose. Now, here's something I, I love, too, about this story. Mary moves in haste to see her cousin Elizabeth. She reaches out to somebody else who has found her role in the theodrama. Right? So Elizabeth, too, she's pregnant with John the Baptist. She knows her purpose in God's story. Now listen to me. The ego drama, as I've suggested, tends to drive us apart from each other. Because I got my little story, you got your little story, and we're just going to tolerate each other. But no, no, don't you impose anything on me. I won't impose things on you. Well, it, it drives us apart. It produces, if you want, the litigious and divisive society that we have. 
us against them, this individual against that individual, everybody claiming rights and prerogatives and privileges. A divided society, hostile, antagonistic. The theodrama tends to draw us together because once I discovered my role, listen now, in a purpose that transcends my little petty preoccupations, I've discovered my role in, in God's drama. Well, then I'm linked to everybody else who's found his or her role in that same theodrama. Is now we come together in common purpose. Again, I know I've used this before with you, but um, this old Aristotelian idea of the transcendent third, when the great philosopher said that a, a relationship or a friendship or a marriage will endure not so much when the two are connected to each other, but when the two together are connected to a transcendent third, some transcendent good that they both love. Well, this is preeminently true of the theodrama. Together we know what God wants us to do. And so beautifully, Mary and Elizabeth come together. Mind you, not in rivalry. That's you know the, the sign that we're caught in the ego drama is that we we start conflicting with each other, right? So my my little project is getting in the way of your little project, and so we start fighting. <laughs> it's true across the board in human affairs, isn't it? Is that we just tend to be at odds with each other because we are living ego dramatically. When we discover our role in the theodrama, then we start coming together for common purpose. Years ago, when I was a student in France, I heard a marvelous sermon for the, for the visitation. And this, the preacher used the phrase, lovely in French, cette conspiration féminine. It means, literally, if you translate it, this feminine conspiracy. <laughs> of course, conspiracy in English has a, a negative overtone, like a conspiracy theory. But conspiration, well, it's from the Latin, spirare, which means to breathe, right? A conspiration is a breathing together. It's a coming together for common and mutual purpose. Beautiful. The visitation is a conspiration feminine between these two women who have found their role in the theodrama. Okay. Now, what can we say a little more specifically about the theodrama they're in? It has a lot to do with David. Now go back to our first reading from the prophet Micah, prophesying about this little town of Bethlehem from which will come this Savior. Listen now. He, the Savior, shall stand firm and shepherd his flock by the strength of the Lord. In the majestic name of the Lord his God, and his greatness shall reach to the ends of the earth, he shall be peace. Mike is speaking now out of this great tradition that says, from David, a descendant will come who will be the true king, who will be the true shepherd, who will, like his ancestor David, gather the tribes, who will cleanse and purify the temple and restore the fortunes of Israel. Okay, and we can hear that now up and down the Psalms and, and in much of the Old Testament. But I want you to notice something, again, in this description. Yes, a Davidic king is being described. Yes, this human figure. He shall stand firm and shepherd his flock by the strength of the Lord, etc. But then this, his greatness shall reach to the ends of the earth, and he shall be peace. By implication, for all the nations of the world. Well, we're going way beyond the job description of a king of a little Middle Eastern uh, uh, nation. I mean, sure, this human figure, descendant of David, could do these good things for the sake of Israel. But this grand, this almost impossibly grand description that he will be peace, his authority will extend to all the nations. See, what's being suggested, everybody? And again, you can find it throughout the Old Testament, that this figure, yes, is a descendant of David. Yes, he is a human figure. He's more than that. He's more than that. 
He's also strangely the God of Israel. And again, look in these great texts. When the Lord says, I myself will come and shepherd my people. Now, the, the reference is to a, a Davidic king who'll shepherd, but yet through behind that figure, it's the Lord himself will shepherd his people. Now, that's if we're reading it with, with care, we're reading it completely. That's what the Old Testament is predicting. A Davidic figure who is also the God of Israel himself come to shepherd his people. All right, all right. Now, with that in the background, what's the theodrama that these two women, cette conspiration féminine, this feminine conspiracy, what are they part of? Well, listen to Elizabeth. How does this happen to me? that the mother of my Lord should come to me. Now, Mary, her cousin, pregnant, I mean, obviously with, with this human figure. But she doesn't say, how marvelous, Mary, that, that you who are going to give birth to this, to this human, <laughs> purely human child has come to me. No, no. Listen again. How does it happen to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me, Adonai. And they knew what they're talking about. When someone at this time and in this place, when a Jew of that time and place would use the term Adonai of the Lord, she's talking about the God of Israel. She knows, and Elizabeth becomes one of the very first proclaimers of the gospel. She knows that the one with whom Mary is pregnant is a son of David, yes indeed, but also the son of God. See, that's, that's the theodrama these two women are involved in, the coming to birth of the son of God. And then that gorgeous detail. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, we hear, the infant leaped in her womb. If Mary is bearing the son of God, then she is the Ark of the Covenant par excellence, right? The Ark of the Covenant, which in David's time bore the presence of the God of Israel. And David, when he brought that Ark into his holy city of Jerusalem, did a festive dance in its presence. So John the Baptist, who like his mother, is a proclaimer of this truth because he does his own version of David's dance in the womb of his mother, not before a merely human figure, but before the Lord. Now, here's the marvelous thing, friends. I'll end with this. We're part of the same theodrama. These, these are events that happened long ago with this wonderful conspiration féminine. But we're part of the same story because our job is to proclaim this same Christ to the nations, that his name might go out to the ends of the world and that he might be peace. That job is now in our hands. Let's give up the boring ego drama. Let's give up the game that our culture keeps trying to make us play and embrace this marvelous, soul-expanding theodrama. And then, like Mary, trust me when I tell you, we'll go in haste. We'll do our, our role in the theodrama with enthusiasm. And God bless you. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I invite you to share it and to subscribe to my YouTube channel.